comes on strong, He is stronger. And let me introduce you to Mr. Sully Cole as you're grabbing a seat. Sully, uh, come back up one step. You know, wave to everybody. You got a lot of family sitting right over here. Where, where are your parents, Jamie and Trissa? Y'all would love this. Uh, we're standing backstage as uh, the band's doing that last song for us. It, it wouldn't surprise you with musical parents. He is singing every word to the song. And, um, and you know what I love about it? You're singing it because you know Jesus. And you know that he is the answer to, to everything. And, uh, and you were sharing with me earlier that John 3.16 is in your testimony too, that that's your favorite verse. Here's how that verse would be spoken to you today. This is what God would say. He says, I so love Sully that I gave my only son Jesus so that by believing in him, Sully would have everlasting life. And that's what we're celebrating today because you believed in Jesus and you have put your trust in him. And you prayed back during vacation Bible school one evening with your mom and dad for Jesus to come and, and to live in your heart, to transform you and to change your life forever. And uh, do you remember our uh, Bible verse for Vacation Bible School? Uh. Yeah, we just, I'm going to help you remember it. It's Ephesians, remember it's out of Ephesians. And it said, our God is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And you know what, Sully, that's true in your life. That our God is able to do more than you could ever begin to imagine. And that's what he's going to do for you. And I've gotten to know you a little bit over these last few years. And to just watch you continue to grow and how mature you are and the purpose you have in life and the joy also that you find in life. God is going to use all of those things to do something powerful through you. More than you could even begin to imagine. More than you could ever ask him because he loves you so much. And so today when we baptize you, this is just the next step in a journey in which you are going to see God do some amazing things. And so you ready to get baptized? Well, let me ask you a couple questions first. Sully, is Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Do you trust him? Yes. Do you want to live your life following him each and every day? Yes. And do you want to get baptized? Yes. 
Well, then, Sully, my brother, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with Christ in baptism, and you are risen to new life in Him. Let's stand and celebrate this transformed life. The storm rises from the deep. The rages around me. I will remember Winds out Wars within my heart Battle long lost lost I will remember
Amen. And would you pray with me? Let's, let's pray together for a moment. Lord, we celebrate that good news. That, that no matter what we're facing in our lives, no matter what we're facing in this world, that we can be more than conquerors because of your power. That your power that is at work in us, loving us, transforming us, uh, changing us and, and changing the world. And our prayer is that as we gather to worship you, that we would experience the power of that love. That, that our hearts would be open and that you would come in and, and you would fill our hearts with your very presence as we worship you and, and as we open your word and as we learn your truth. Come, Lord Jesus, and change us in this hour so that we can confidently declare that we really are more than conquerors. For we pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. You guys look great. You are. Well, someone on the front row said I am. And, uh, or we are. And uh, we, are, we are just so glad that you are here. Let me say a special welcome to anyone who might be new to Mountaintop. And maybe this is even your first time here. We are so glad that you found us on the mountaintop and you joined us for worship this morning. Uh, what we hope that you will discover is that we are just ordinary people who have discovered an extraordinary truth that life really is better with Jesus. And so we are doing all we can to learn and to share his better way to live with everyone that we can. And our hope is we'll get to do that with you this morning. Uh, we'd love to tell you more about who we are as a church. And you got a study guide when you came in the door. In the very back of it, there's a little card. And if you fill that out, you can either put it in an offering bucket at the end of the service, or you can take it out these doors to our group's desk. And they have a gift for you and, and just can answer any questions that you may have about our church. But we, most of all, are just so, so glad that you are here. We are glad you are all here. And so why don't you turn and greet one another and welcome each other to worship this morning. And if you're watching online, we are just so grateful you get to plug into Mountaintop that way. Uh, check in. Let us know where you're watching the service from and who's watching the service with you this morning. And we're glad you get to be a part of the Mountaintop community. One of these days the sky's going to break and everything will escape. And I'll know. One of these days the mountains are gonna fall into the sea And they'll know That you and I were made for this I was made to taste your kiss We were made to never fall away Never fall So if this is your first time to Mountaintop today, as Doug said, we are continuing the series from Jeremiah. And in case you weren't here last week, I just want to take a second and do a quick recap from last week because the message that we talked about carries over into the passages that we are looking at today. And so last week we studied the message of Jeremiah chapter 11. And what we learned is that Israel as a nation was uncommitted and they were unfaithful to the covenant that they had with God. And so God had been really clear in the covenant that he made with them. Israel, here's the deal. If you obey me, it will go well for you and you will receive blessings. And that's all I want you to do is obey. Or option B is if you choose to disobey me, then there will be consequences and there will be curses. And the choice is yours and I'm telling you which way it'll go better. And in theory, Israel went, we will go with B. Thank you so much for the choice. And Israel chose to disobey God. And what we talked about last week, the word picture that we held into our mind was that Israel as a nation was an unfaithful bride to God. And their unfaithfulness had consequences. And so today, our focus text in Jeremiah is chapter 11, verses 18, verse 18, through chapter 20, um, verse 18. And of course, time prevents us from being able to read those nine chapters together. 
So what we're going to do over the next few minutes is that we're going to look at the big picture. And if you have a Bible and you want to open it, you can open it to Jeremiah chapter 17 because there's a couple of verses in there that I hope we're going to take out of here and really meditate on this week. It's totally fine if you don't have a Bible because I'm actually going to be jumping around in those chapters today to try to get us to get the big picture. So the scriptures will be up on the screens and I'm going to be using the message version of scripture today because I feel like the emotion in it really captures the emotion that was happening at the time. And so before we get started, I want to take a second and just ask God one more time to make sure that our minds are undistracted and that he is with us. So God, I pray right now that you would clear everything that we came in here with from our minds and that we would spend the next few minutes engaging you and listening to you. God, I pray that your word is delivered clearly and faithfully and it is for your glory. In your name I pray, amen. So if these chapters had a soundtrack, perhaps in the background there would be a solemn drumbeat. And that drumbeat would be there because it's warning the people that true to God's word, destruction is coming because Israel has chosen to ignore God. And when the word came to Israel, when it came to the people that destruction is coming, they want God to ignore their unfaithfulness and help them out of the mess that they got in. And so their attitudes are best summed up in Jeremiah chapter 14. And I'm going to read it with the kind of attitude that I think they were displaying as they were saying this. And so they say this to God. Okay, God, we know we're guilty. We've lived bad lives, but do something, God. Do it for your sake. Time and time again, we've betrayed you. No doubt about it, we've sinned against you. Hope of Israel, our only hope. Israel's last chance in this trouble. Why are you acting like a tourist, taking in the sights here today and gone tomorrow? Why do you just stand there and stare like someone who doesn't know what to do in a crisis? It's almost painful to read these words. I'm like, God, I'm only, this is pretend, not me. Okay. But God, you are, in fact, here, here with us. You know who we are. You named us. So don't leave us in the lurch. And I read it that way because I want us to sense how brash the people had become with God. In a sense, they're saying, okay, God, yeah, 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 but we're your peeps. Give us a pass. And the problem, as we talked about last week, is that if God doesn't follow through with the consequences that he told them were coming, then he wouldn't be true to his word. And so the people are trying to get him to change the terms of the covenant. Okay, yeah, God, you said that if we obeyed, disobeyed you, that consequences were coming. But really what we want from you is we want you to be inconsistent like we have been. And the problem is, or the truth is, that they had forgotten what a consistent God they followed. And he is going to be true to the covenant that he made with them, even though they have not been. And so to show the consequences and to get Jeremiah to really feel how bad things had gotten, God gives a very powerful and painful word picture in Jeremiah chapter 13 when he tells Jeremiah that the people had fallen so far away from God that they had become no better than a dirty undergarment, which is a gross picture, but it's really helpful for us to be like, oh, wow. Things have gotten really, really bad. And so as a prophet, as God's mouthpiece, Jeremiah had the fun job of delivering all these tough messages, right? And so imagine that when Jeremiah walks into the temple and he's the guest speaker for the day and he says, okay, here's my message. Um, doom is coming. The hammer is going to fall. God's not going to listen to your cries and you're going to be broken like a clay pot. Uh, my business card will be available when you leave the temple, right? No one wants to deliver that message. When you deliver those kind of hard messages, it does not make you the favorite preacher in town. And so on top of having to deliver these hard messages, Jeremiah's teachings were being refuted by false teachers because there were false teachers in the region who were telling the people what they wanted to hear. And these false teachers were kind of throwing God's name in there, even though they had not heard from God. And so as Jeremiah is teaching a tough word, these false teachers are saying, listen, you know that guy, Jeremiah, he's a little bit off his rocker. He's not hearing from God. You're God's people. 
really, is God going to destroy you? No. You are only going to have peace. Don't even worry about what Jeremiah is saying. And so, of course, the people want to believe what these false teachers are saying. And so you can only imagine that they were even more angry with Jeremiah. And there are several instances throughout these nine chapters, if you haven't read them, I hope you'll go and read them this week, where the people are cruel to Jeremiah. And they accuse him of being a madman. And they lie in wait, waiting to attack him. And some of these people waiting to attack him are his friends. And so Jeremiah in chapter 20 even cries out and he says, I feel like there's terror on every side. And so the picture that I want us to feel from these nine chapters is that Jeremiah is struggling. And Jeremiah is weary and discouraged. And we hear his heart in verses like Jeremiah 11 when he says, I didn't know they had it in for me. I didn't know of their behind-the-scenes plots. Let's get rid of the preacher. That will stop the sermons. Let's get rid of him for good. He won't be remembered for long. And so in addition to feeling attacked by his friends and rejected and persecuted by the people, these things, because we are human, right? And Jeremiah is human just like you are. And he wants to be faithful, but he's kind of feeling beaten down. And so when he feels this, not only is he wrestling inside, he kind of starts wrestling with God. And in Jeremiah 12, Jeremiah says to God, okay, You are right, oh God, and you set things right. I cannot argue with that. But God, I got some questions. Why do bad people have it so good? Why do con artists make it big? You planted them, and they put down roots, and they flourished and produced fruit, and they talk as if they're old friends with you, but they couldn't care less about you. And meanwhile, God, you know me inside and out, and you don't let me get by with a thing. Make them pay for the way they live. Pay with their lives like sheep marked for slaughter. The thing that I love the most about these nine chapters is how honest Jeremiah is with God. And as he expresses his weariness and discouragement to God through prayer, these words sound really similar to another guy in Scripture named Job who also went through a hard time. And Job was a righteous man. His story is in the Old Testament as well. And he follows God. And one day, in one fell swoop, he loses everything. He loses his home, his crops, his family, his children. And when he loses those things, even though Job never curses God, he does wrestle with why. Why, God? And so what we see is that Jeremiah is also wrestling with the age-old question of why. Why does it seem like the wicked prosper? Why is it that I, the guy who's doing what you've asked me to do, is having a harder time than the people who aren't doing what you ask? Has anybody in here except me ever wrestled with a question around something, why? I mean, I heard someone laugh, like, psh, yeah. It's natural. And the thing that I love the most about God's Word is that God inspired this Word to be written and He made it available to us to let us see that it is okay to pour our hearts out to God when we don't understand and when we are having a hard time. And so in these chapters, God listens to Jeremiah And he hears what he's saying. And as Jeremiah is pouring out his heart to God, not only does God listen and not only does he hear, but he answers. And in Jeremiah 12, these are two of my favorite verses in these chapters. Jeremiah 12, God says this to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, if you're worn out in this foot race with men, what makes you think you can race against horses? And if you can't keep your wits during times of calm, what is going to happen when troubles break loose, like the Jordan, which was a river, in flood? And so I want us to get a visual picture, because when I read Scripture, it is helpful for me to put myself in that situation and realize that these people are just like me, and what was Jeremiah feeling? And so here's the picture that these chapters are telling us, and this is why these words are really intriguing to me. 
If you can imagine that Jeremiah, after a long day in the office or, or out about preaching, and he has had to deliver some tough messages, and his friends are attacking him, and he's in my mind's eye, he's walking home one day, and he just sits down by the side of the road, and he kind of puts his head in his hands, and in my mind, he just says, you know, God, why? This is hard. Is it worth it? And in that moment, in a sense, God comes to Jeremiah and he puts his hand on Jeremiah's shoulder. And here's what he's going to say, Jeremiah, I need you to trust me. Will you do that? Because Jeremiah, yes, you have been stretched and you are being stretched. But what I want to be clear on is that you are going to be stretched far beyond what you have been stretched right now. See, right now you're struggling, but right now you're just in a foot race with men. And one day you're going to be competing with men on horseback. It's going to get even more intense. And so, Jeremiah, what I need you to know is this. Though there is not a road around what I have called you to do, there is a road through it. And so Jeremiah, completing the journey, racing against horses, will be possible. The impossible will be possible. And though it will be tough, you will make it exceedingly if you do two things, Jeremiah. If you stick with me and you choose to trust me, even when it's tough. And so what God is doing in that moment is that he is laying out for Jeremiah the path and the cost of discipleship. See, discipleship is following God and it's choosing to trust God in every circumstance, even in the circumstances where we're scratching our head and we're saying, why? And God, what we know from the scriptures is that God will use every single circumstance in our life, just like he did with Jeremiah, to build our trust in him. And we know that because in Jeremiah 17, this is what God tells Jeremiah. He says in verses 7 through 8, listen, Jeremiah, blessed is the man who trusts me, God. The woman who sticks with God. This is one of my favorite word pictures in scripture. Here's what it looks like for people who trust God. God says they're like trees replanted in Eden, putting down roots near the rivers. Now, what do we think about a tree, right? Stands firm, but the tree's got to have roots. But it's not just roots in the ground. It's roots that are connected to a living water source. So the people who trust in me, they have roots that are always connected to a source who is nourishing them. Never a worry through the hottest of summers. Can we agree that we are experiencing the hottest of summers and that river sounds good right now? Never dropping a leaf, serene and calm through droughts, bearing fresh fruit every season. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. A puzzle that no one can figure out, but I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are and not as they pretend to be. So according to this passage, trust in God is key, and it is the thing that will help us no matter what circumstance comes into our life, because when we trust God, we develop roots that are always connected to the source who never runs dry. It is a living water, and that means that when we trust in Him, it no matter what comes against us in life, we will not be destroyed. In fact, not only will be, we be destroyed, we will bear fruit no matter what season of life it is. It's a promise. And the reason it's a promise is because Jesus alludes to this later in the book of John when he says, in this world, you will have trouble. And here's the thing that I think it's easy to forget. Trouble is going to come in our lives whether we follow God or not. But Jesus says, and here's the deal, if you stick with me and trust me, then you can take heart because I have overcome the world. 
And so what that means is that consistent God who's giving this message to Jeremiah right now about roots and flourishing is the same God who speaks later and says, take heart, I have overcome the world. And so what this consistent God is clear on is that it might not be easy and the road will be tough sometimes, but if we stick with God, we will overcome because he has overcome everything that we're going to face. Which means that, yes, that's a one person I'm clapping with you. It means victory is imminent. It's imminent. And so when God tells Jeremiah that he searches the heart and examines the mind, in the King James Version of the Bible, that phrase, examine the mind, is translated, try the reins. Now, I know we got some horseback riders in here, Linda Crump. And when you ride a horse... What happens is there is a bit that goes into the mouth of the horse and there's a bridle that goes over his head and then there are reins which the rider steers and that's how the rider steers the horse by trying the reins. And so God is continually trying our reins to see if we trust him because he examines our hearts and our minds to see if we are really looking to him. Because we can say it all day long, but he examines our hearts to see if we are really trusting him. And just like a horse that pulls on that bit, when the horse pulls on the bit in his mouth, it's painful when he pulls away from the rider. And so when we pull away from what God asks us to do, God knows that we are going the wrong way, that we aren't trusting him. And so he will allow circumstances to come into our lives to help get us back on track. Because the more that we pull away from him, the more God sees it hurts us. You're pulling away from me and you're pulling in the wrong direction. And I know that you're headed towards a mess. So if you will just trust me and go the direction that I'm steering with you, I'm steering you towards the best direction. And if we will trust his guidance and if we will trust his strength and trust his direction, the easier it will be for us because we will be in step with the person who knows us best. I had a girl come up to me in between services and she, uh, she said her mother raises horses and so she grew up on horse farms. And she said, you know what, Mary Beth, I want to tell you something about what you said. The coolest part about riding horses is this. You only need the bit and the bridle and the reins for a while. Once the horse knows you well and there's a trust relationship between the rider and the horse, the bridle and the bit come off and there's a beautiful symphony between the rider and the horse because trust exists. That's what God is moving us to ultimately. True trust. And so Israel in all these chapters had quit trusting God and they were heading towards disaster. And so God challenges Jeremiah. See Jeremiah, this is what happens when you don't trust me. It doesn't go well. So the message from Jeremiah extends to those of us who say we follow Christ. And every single one of us is invited to follow Christ, and the choice is ours. And when we do choose to follow Christ, God invites us to live differently. And we talked about that last week. God invites us to live His way, which is called discipleship. And there is a cost to discipleship. In the New Testament book of Matthew, Jesus called it choosing the narrow way. He talks about it as inviting us to take up our cross and follow Him. So Jesus was real clear. Jesus says there's two roads in life. There's a wide road, and this wide road is the one that most people are going to choose because it seems like the more fun and easy way, but what the world doesn't realize is that the end of this road is destruction. But Jesus says, I have a narrow way that fewer people choose, but if they will choose this way, they will get their life back. Because at the end of this road is life that is truly life. And so what are some of the costs of discipleship? When we say that term, what does it mean when there's a cost to discipleship? Well, I think there's an extreme example that unfortunately happened in South Carolina a few months ago when people were persecuted and killed for their faith. And the odds of that happening in here this morning are very slim, but that is definitely a cost to discipleship. But let me share with you this. 
I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who made a major change in his life about five years ago. And we started talking about what was it like when he began to live differently. And this is what he shared. As we begin to live differently and do life God's way, people are going to question us and they might not like it. They might not like the changes they see in us. And sometimes we're going to be called to speak truth and it's going to make people angry sometimes. And if you decide to make changes in your life and go and do things God's way, people may start to give you a hard time, especially if people have known you for a long time and they know you a certain way. Because he said that when he first started following Christ, people were teasing him and saying things like this. You used to be fun. Now you're boring. Or he said that his friends said, oh boy, you bought into that Jesus stuff. You're drinking the Kool-Aid at Mountaintop. And he said, I was accused of judging people simply when I chose not to participate in something. Some of your friendships may change. Church, when we do do life God's way, when we go down the narrow road, it is tough. And part of the thing we have to do is surrender our natural inclinations. But let's think about this. Even though there's a cost, the cost leads to benefits. And I'll give you one example. So... The natural inclination for us when we get angry with someone is to retaliate or to want to hold a grudge and stay in unforgiveness. And God says, nope, I'll tell you, that's the wide road because retaliation and holding a grudge and holding on to unforgiveness is only going to hurt you. I want to invite you down this narrow way where I'm going to teach you how to forgive like you have been forgiven. And then you're going to be free of all that mess that's inside of your heart. And you're going to experience life that is truly life. That's the narrow way. So even though we surrender our natural inclinations, there are so many benefits like loving our enemies, praying for those people who hurt us. When we do that, we are free of the chains that people going down the wide road are dancing in without even knowing it. The cost of discipleship is high, but so are the rewards. Because the rewards of following Christ far outweigh the cost. And the rewards that Jesus gives us when we choose to do life His way aren't necessarily tangible things. But the ultimate reward is, of course, heaven, this perfect place where we will never experience pain or sorrow and trouble ever again. But then there's a reward of following Christ here on this earth. And let me just give you a few in closing. Number one, it's being able to follow a God who didn't just tell us how to follow him. He modeled it for us. Jesus didn't just say, hey, do this. Jesus said, I'm going to come and do this for you so that you can learn from me how to do life. Another reward is being known and loved as you are by God. It is a psychological fact that every single one of us in here want to be known and fully loved, but every single one of us in here are afraid that if people really know us, they won't love us. Guess what? God knows you and He adores you. You are known and loved by God. Another reward of following Christ is realizing that you have a God-given purpose in life. I sat down with a lady two weeks ago who said, you know what, I just want to matter. I just want to matter. And what is stirring up in her soul is that she's beginning to do life God's way. She doesn't want to pursue all those things that seemed so satisfying a few months ago. She's like, I'm hungry for more. And I believe that just over the horizon, God has the greatest assignment for her because she wants to do life His way. It's a reward. I've got something coming for you that's going to be beyond the humdrum that you're in right now. A reward is being restored to health. Some of you came in here this morning feeling wounded, weary, and discouraged. God, the reward of following Christ is that He's going to restore you to a place of wholeness that you never knew. And another reward is being able to pour out your heart to a God who won't abandon you. And you were able to pour out your heart to a God who is okay when you have times that you question why. The cost of discipleship is high, but so are the rewards. And as God invited Jeremiah to trust him, you and I are invited this morning to trust and stick with him. And he promises us that if we will, no matter what the circumstances come into our life, we will experience abundant life. And that nothing will overcome us because he has overcome anything that we face. 
And so the question that you and I have to ask ourselves this morning is, are we willing to trust that word? Are we willing to trust him? And so I just want to take a few minutes. I want to invite a young lady up here who this morning, um, Maggie Adams is one of our missionaries. She's one of our international missionaries. And, you know, we can talk about the word of God all day long, but there's nothing like a testimony. Thank you, Shay, to put an exclamation point on what we are talking about. And so Maggie um, teaches at a Christian school in Bethlehem. And so Maggie, you'll hear Maggie's story around church. And when she and I were talking the other day, and I knew that she was going to do her testimony today. And she said, you know what, I'm not really sure what I'm going to say. And then as we were talking about the message and you shared your heart, it was exactly in line with what we're talking about this morning. And so Maggie, I want to ask you, have you always been a teacher at heart? Um, I I think so. I I didn't realize it for a long time. Um, Before I became a teacher, I was actually at UAB doing a program uh, training to be in research. And I started to realize that even though everything was going according to plan, I didn't really love it the way I thought I would. And as I started to question my plan, God sort of started revealing his to me. And he helped me to see that I have always been a teacher. I was made to be a teacher. I was trying to teach when I was five years old. I actually saw this video of me at that time when I was making a gingerbread house with my mom. And I was actually trying to teach her how to do it, even though I've never done it before. And um, besides the point, uh, I, I, I can't seem to think of a time where I wasn't trying to share things that I had learned and, and to, to share the information that I, I've just found interesting. and. Well, annoying for some people, I realized that that's just who I am and it's who God made me to be. Well, and I asked you that question because in the first service you said that when you, were, when you were looking at the video of yourself teaching your mom, you actually still agreed with little yeah. you, right? <laughs> and that you were like, actually, the five-year-old was right. No, seriously, if you just do, uh, give her the thing, mom. Yes. No, um, and I, yeah, I, I did. But, okay, so one thing that you shared, and I loved this, was that um, you came to Mountaintop a few, when you were 18 years old, and you didn't love it at first. There was a message that really hit you, and why didn't you love it? What was going on? Yeah, the, the first time I came to Mountaintop, I was 18, like you said, and um, Pastor Bill was talking about some uh, of the needs internationally and ways that the church should be active in, in serving the international community. And all I felt was helpless. I was so frustrated and angry that I was faced with this need that I couldn't do anything about that I actually left service and went out into the parking lot and cried Mm. um and looking back I've come to realize that that was the moment that the Lord called me to international missions he gave me his heart for it and I couldn't see that he did give me a way to help I wasn't helpless but I just wasn't able to see it yet And one of the reasons I wanted Maggie to share that story is because sometimes when we sit in here and we feel God working in our heart, we have one of two reactions. Either we're like, yes, I I feel like I want to do this, or there's a natural inclination to say, this sounds really tough and back away from it. And that's kind of where you were at the time. And then God kept stirring your heart one step at a time and called you to something um, in Bethlehem. And so Maggie, what I want you to share with them is what are some of the rewards that have come from following Christ? Well, um, I think one of the biggest things is that, um, like you said, God stirs things in us. And I started to realize that um, I was becoming who he always made me to be. And I was able to live in the exact place that he wanted me to be, doing exactly what he wanted me to do. And there's such a freedom in that. It's like, um, I think uh, in Christianity, we talk a lot about how Um, when you follow Jesus, he makes you into someone new. And I don't think that's necessarily exactly what's happening. I think what happens is we build up this facade, this sort of character of who the world wants us to be or who we want ourselves to be. And he slowly strips that away and, and helps us to see who we really are. And there's such a joy and fulfillment in doing exactly what he designed you to do. He doesn't call you to something that you don't enjoy. You know, I find such a a happiness in doing what I do, and it's way better than anything I had planned for myself. And I think that that's an amazing blessing. And on top of that, I get to be a part of the amazing work that he's doing. Um, Bethlehem is a place that is, um, because of all the conflict going on in, in the Middle East and in that part of the world, there is a lot of anger and resentment and very little hope in the community where I work. And I have been able to see God 
actively healing those those hearts and actively bringing uh, hope and peace and, and love into that community. And I get to be a part of it. And I get to do work that I know matters. Um, in fact, I uh, shared with Mary Beth that I have a student who is in my class who, when he was about 13 years old, uh, his best friend was shot and killed accidentally, and even though he wasn't participating in anything political. And um, this brought so much anger and resentment into my student's heart, and he has since shared that being at our school and being continuously taught about love and grace and forgiveness, it's helped him to let go of some of that hatred that was brewing inside of him, and I've seen him actively striving for forgiveness and wanting to work toward peace, which is an amazing step that I think is such a blessing that I get to be a part of that work that God's doing. Now, I'm not saying it's our school. I'm saying it's God through our school, and I, I'm really grateful that I get to be a part of it. And at this point, the concept of doing anything else it is impossible for me to think of. Um, there's a, a scripture actually in Jeremiah that Mary Beth didn't quote from this section. And it's, Jeremiah says that when he, ev he ever tries to stop speaking the words that God gives him to speak, they burn within him. And that's how I feel when I come home and I don't have my work day to day. I appreciate that I have time to have a sabbatical and to um, spend time with my family, but I ache for my work. I want to be with my students. I miss them. I talk about them all the time. And um, I think a big part of that is um, when you are given a call and a, a fulfillment, anything else than total commitment to what God has for you is just not fulfilling. I love it. And one thing you said about your student that really hit me was it's his natural inclination to want to harbor forgiveness, but that would only, I mean, to harbor unforgiveness and anger, but it was tearing him up on the inside. And then hearing about the narrow way, doing life God's way has brought soothing and healing into his soul, which I absolutely love. I really wish I could bring him here for people to meet because he is such an amazing young man and he really does have such a good heart. And I'm so glad that being in a place um, that we are able to, to help protect that from being stifled by, by anger or hatred. I love it. And so Maggie, um, God has called you to this, and now everybody's going to be called to something different, but how have you felt God's presence with you every single step of the way? Well, um, there's, there's sort of two main ways that I find that God has been with me, and one is when my students come to me and they uh, have struggles or they want some kind of guidance, uh, I'm really blessed to be in a position to, to get very uh, close with them. I, I uh, visit their families and that sort of thing. When they come to me with their problems, he gives me the right words to say. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of wisdom. I'm not very experienced in life, but he knows what they need to hear, and he lets me uh, say the right things in the right time, and that's um, great. <laughs> and then um, more than that, he has given me a heart for these people in this place. Before I went, I never had any plan to be in this part of the world. I didn't know that much about it. I didn't have a heart for this place until I got there. But the more time I spend there, the more love I have for these students in this community. I feel like they're my own students, or I'm sorry, my own children, even though some of them are not that much younger than I am. Um, but I feel such a, a love for them and a, a pride in their growth and their accomplishments. And I think that it's God giving me his heart mm -hmm. to share with them mm -hmm. that I am able to experience his love, not only for them, but also I can feel it. And I know that that's what he feels for me. Absolutely. So I get to not only experience his love, but I get to share it. And that is an amazing blessing. And it's uh, able to get me through any of the difficult things that come up because it is hard. Um, the first time I met a teacher from our school and I asked them about this experience, he said, this is the hardest and best thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And if anybody ever asks me, I always quote him and say, this is the hardest but best thing I have ever done. And so Maggie, what, as, I, as you shared with me the other day and as you're sharing with today, if, you know, again, God will call you to whatever he's going to call you to do. But when you are connected with him, the, the passion that I see in you is compelling and it's motivating because when you talk about it, I want to come, but it's what you've been called to do, which is different. But yet at the same time, what I see in you is God, you are exactly where God has you and you are having a purpose driven life because of what he's called you to do. And so it's awesome. 
I, I think that um, each of us is called to something different, and I happen to be called to international missions, and sometimes people ask me, like, why don't you come serve in America? Lord knows that we need people here. And I think about it, and I, I try to explain, I'm where God called me to be, mm -hmm. and I have to do my work, but we are all called to something, and he can use us everywhere, but it, we have to take that first step of trust. And sometimes you have to take a small step just to develop that trust with him. You know, learn. I didn't start off by flying halfway across the world. I started by praying just, just once to see how he would respond. Give up one thing he says is bad for you or for me, I guess is what I did. Um, you know, do one thing he commands, like forgive someone you don't want to forgive and feel the peace. He's going to be faithful every single time. And once you build that trust, the idea of, you know, following him is so much easier. It's like Mary Beth said with riding the horse without a bridle. Once you have that trust, letting him guide you is the easiest thing in the world. I love it, Maggie. Thank you so much. Give her some love. Thanks, get her with me. I always forget. So this is true for us as well. And so um, the ushers are going to come right now during the song. And this is our time where we give back in the service. And the dollars that we give go to support ministries like what Maggie is involved in right now. And they go to support things locally. And we have a lot of partnerships that we have engaged. And they go to support things on the mountain that are going on downstairs and around the church this morning. And so as they come and we meditate on this great God and what he's done for us, some of you in here today may feel a call to step out and do something different. And it could be as simple as pray for the first time. It could be as simple as forgiving someone that you came in here holding on to a grudge with. Whatever it is, try it. Trust him. He is trustworthy. And so Maggie, I know you'll be outside um, at the ISR booth and they can find out more ways to support you. But really quickly, what are two quick ways that they can support you? Uh, the, the first is if anybody uh, has any inkling of a calling to uh, join us and to come and teach, that is our number one need. Our teachers willing to give of their time and to come and work uh, at our school. And I'll be happy to answer any questions about that. And then the number one thing is to pray for us. I have seen prayer work in miraculous ways. And so if you could pray that our students have an open heart to receive the truth of, of love and grace and forgiveness that um, we try to share from, from Jesus and that we are given the right words to say and that we can really um, see growth in our, in our school and in our community, that would be an amazing blessing. And I'd really appreciate that support. We'll be praying for you and you're brave. You. And God will make us brave as we take steps out. Thanks, Maggie.
I love that song. Thank you. Thank you so much for singing that. Blessed is the man who trusts me, God, the woman who sticks with God. They're like trees replanted in Eden, putting down roots near the rivers, never a worry through the hottest of summers, never dropping a leaf, serene and calm through droughts, bearing fresh fruit in every season. Will we trust that promise? Lord, we love you so much. You are a good God. When we sing that song, God, oh, I just love it. I love it. I love it. Because you are the champion of heaven who made a way for all of us to enter in. And then here on this earth, we don't have to be afraid of anything. And so different people are going through things right now, some tough, some good. But the good thing is you're with us no matter what if we will only trust you and stick with you. God, thank you for that word picture. And may we leave here today knowing you who you are and being willing to make the choice to take the narrow road. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Have a great week. Hello, everybody online. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Remember that if you will just trust God and stick with Him, He will be with you every single step of the way, no matter what you face. And you will overcome because He has. Have a great week. You made me